Capitol Hill is debating the endless frontier spending bill, but one amendment has already passed, blocking funding for gain-of-function virus research in China's Wuhan lab. The lab leak theory resurfaces in news headlines. U.S. President Biden says he has asked the intelligence community to dig deeper into the origins of the pandemic. China's flood season kicks off early this year. Nearly 80 rivers in southern China have already surpassed warning levels and may soon start to overflow. And Hollywood actor John Cena is apologizing to Chinese fans after he referred to Taiwan as a country. Many Americans are now accusing him of appeasing the Chinese regime for access to the Chinese market. But a Hollywood producer says this is part of a bigger systemic issue. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. The Endless Frontier Act faces mounting scrutiny by both Democrats and Republicans. NTD's Steve Lance brings us the details from Washington, D.C., and how an amendment to the bill passed uncontested. The Endless Frontier Act, also known as Senate Bill 1260, has been hotly debated in the Senate. The bill is sponsored by Democrat Senator Chuck Schumer. It's mostly aimed at helping the United States compete with China in the technology sector. But during an appearance on Tucker Carlson tonight, Louisiana Senator John Kennedy begged to differ. Here is a copy of the bill. Uh, it started out at $40 billion. It, the budget office tells me it's up to $200 billion and growing like kudzu. This is not a fight communism bill. If you look at this bill and study it, you will see this is a all four feet and your snout in the trough spending bill with virtually no money going for military defense. The spending plans outlined in the bill have seen bipartisan resistance. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders said parts of it would equate to corporate welfare. And second of all, there is a provision uh, in this bill, not an appropriation, but an authorization to provide uh, some $10 billion uh, to uh, the Blue Origin uh, space uh, company, which is owned by the wealthiest person uh, in the world, uh, Mr. Bezos. Some critics of the bill argue that it's not what the country needs to rein in China's rise. Bills like this often take on a life of their own in negotiations. In some cases, spending for all kinds of areas get baked in. A recent amendment from Senator Rand Paul aimed to block funding for one of those areas. It passed by unanimous consent in the Senate on Tuesday. The addition to the bill prevents the National Institutes of Health from funding gain-of-function research in China. It's a branch of microbiology research that seeks to boost the infection range, strength and transmissibility of viruses. A number of experts believe the U.S. funded this research through Wuhan's Institute of Virology, the lab at the center of the pandemic controversy. Others deny it, including White House medical advisor Dr. Anthony Fauci. I think there's no reason to be sending any money to China for research. They're a rich country. For goodness sakes, we're worried about them outcompeting us, stealing our intellectual property, and then we send them millions of dollars to do research. Although the Endless Frontier Act has met with some bipartisan resistance and calls for a more practical approach in dealing with communist China, it is likely that the bill sponsored by Senator Chuck Schumer will pass with the support of some Republicans. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Steve Lance and News. The lab leak theory is in the news again. President Biden says he's asked the intelligence community to dig deeper into the origins of the CCP virus. NTD's Miguel Moreno has that story. We still don't know exactly how this virus that has come to kill millions of people worldwide came to be. President Biden has now called on the intelligence community to work twice as hard at finding out whether the CCP virus emerged naturally or leaked from a lab. The White House wouldn't say whether China will cooperate with an investigation. So I understand why we want it to get done, but why do we think that China would cooperate? You know, this is, uh, this is something that you have to ask the Chinese government, right? This is something that should be important. It should, should matter to them. Has the president specifically asked or made this ask of President Xi of China for their cooperation in this effort? I'm not, I'm not going to go into uh, details of private conversation that the president uh, may, may have, may have had with, the, with President Xi. 
Dr. Fauci's boss testified to the Senate on Wednesday, saying the virus likely emerged from a natural process, but said a virus leak is also a possibility. In any case, the intelligence community is expected to report back to Biden in 90 days about their investigation. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. For the fifth year in a row, the World Health Organization, or WHO, is excluding Taiwan from the World Health Assembly. This despite calls from the U.S. and all G7 countries for Taiwan's inclusion. On Monday, the WHO kicked off its annual assembly. This year's meeting could arguably be one of its most important. That's because the pandemic continues to impact many parts of the world. Countries that want Taiwan to take part highlight the island's successful pandemic response last year. They argue that the international community could benefit from Taiwan's experience. The U.S. Secretary of State says there is no reasonable justification for Taiwan's continued exclusion from this forum. And the United States calls upon the WHO Director General to invite Taiwan, as it has in previous years, prior to objections registered by Beijing. He argues that global health is more important than political disputes. Communist China has never ruled Taiwan, but has long proclaimed Taiwan as its own territory. Beijing is also actively blocking Taiwan from representing itself on the international stage. The WHO is facing growing criticism for being too closely aligned with the Chinese regime. Taiwan's health minister has previously said that their exclusion from the assembly is due to pressure from Beijing. Taiwan participated in the forum as an observer from 2008 through 2016. But the WHO revoked the invitation after the current Taiwanese president took office in 2016. She is tougher on Beijing than her immediate predecessor. A Chinese vaccine company is extending help to Taiwan. But despite Beijing's offer, some are questioning its intentions. That's because it is also blocking the island from accessing certain Western vaccines. For the first time ever, Taiwan blamed China for blocking a vaccine deal with Germany on Wednesday. Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen said, as for Germany's BioNTech, we were close to completing the contract with the original German plant. But because of China's intervention, up to now there's been no way to complete it. Instead, Chinese drug maker Shanghai Fosun Pharmaceutical says it is willing to provide the BioNTech vaccine doses to Taiwan. But Tsai Ing-wen doesn't seem to want the vaccines from China. She pointed out that only by negotiating with the original manufacturer can you obtain the original manufacturer's direct guarantee and responsibility for quality and safety. Taiwan's Ministry of Health and Welfare also expressed safety concerns about Chinese vaccines. Putting it bluntly, he said Taiwan is interested in vaccines that China isn't using. We are afraid of using vaccines that China uses. Last Friday, Taiwan's health minister asked his U.S. counterpart for help in getting vaccines. The U.S. health secretary answered that he would ask President Biden. Taiwan has ordered millions of shots from AstraZeneca and Moderna as well but has only received about 700,000. Accessing vaccines isn't the only trouble plaguing the island. An apparent army of internet users is attacking Taiwan, creating a rumor mill centered on the island's pandemic situation. Authorities on the island say they believe it is coming from mainland China. Taiwan Centers for Disease Control has added a new section to its website titled Clarification. It is now publishing several articles a day there, aimed at clearing up misinformation. A number of rumors have surfaced, making accusations like Taiwan doctors' chat records talk about falsifying data. Hospitals abandoned patients remains in rivers. And suspected incineration of a large number of virus patients remains. Chen Zhongyan serves as deputy commander for Taiwan's Central Pandemic Command Center. He says he believes the rumors are coming from China. Earlier this week, he pointed out that some of the social media rumors were originally posted in simplified Chinese, a version of Chinese characters used in mainland China, but not Taiwan. He also referenced police investigations, showing that the post's digital IP addresses are located outside Taiwan. On top of that, Chen said some faked social media accounts even impersonated a local newspaper, Taiwan's Liberty Times, using its reach to spread the rumors. 
A researcher at the cross strait Policy Association, Zhang Yushao, also commented on the situation, revealing that some posts even featured videos taken in China's Wuhan last year and tried to pass them off as being captured in Taiwan. More updates on the deadly ultra-marathon race in China. Some victims' families are refusing authorities' compensation proposals. Beijing remained silent for the first two days after the tragedy and only responded following the public outcry. They asked provincial authorities to thoroughly investigate the incident. Chinese media reported local authorities proposed a compensation of $150,000 for each victim's family, including $80,000 of insurance money. And the lump sum compensation will be final. The mayor of the city where the race took place said on Tuesday that over half of the families agreed to sign. Local media reported some of the families that refused to sign think the compensation is too little. A family member also pointed out that this was not a natural disaster, but rather a man-made tragedy. The person seems to indicate that people responsible for it haven't been held accountable. Many Chinese netizens questioned how authorities are dealing with the issue. One wrote, they don't allow the victims' families to contact each other and even audio record the visits. They want to separate people, pay compensation and get it done. It's all rotten. Another netizen says this is the CCP's long-adopted method to divide and conquer the people. 21 runners died during the ultra-marathon race on Saturday. That's over 10 percent of participants. Organizers blamed the extreme weather conditions, but details about the event revealed that the lack of contingency planning has more to do with the tragedy. According to Chinese media, hours after the race started, several runners suffered from physical discomfort and low body temperatures. One of them called for help, but the rescue team didn't arrive until two hours later. Local media cited experts saying that the tragedy may have to do with the fact that rescuers were not on site quickly enough. Another survivor told Chinese media as he gave up the running and went down the mountain, he phoned for help more than 40 times but didn't get any clear guidance. A local shepherd named Zhu Keming rescued six runners during the ultra-marathon race. But he is changing his narrative when a major Chinese state-owned media interviewed him. Zhu was in his cave shelter when he heard cries for help from outside. There was a rainstorm and he soon discovered the athletes, brought them to shelter and lit a fire. He told Chinese state-run media CCTV on Tuesday, That kind of weather is rare, very rare. But just a day before that, he told a local media in an interview, This kind of weather comes very often. There are often such extreme weather conditions. Based on Zhu's account, many Chinese netizens condemned the race's organizers for being unprepared for the extreme weather conditions. But following Zhu's interview with CCTV, netizens can no longer fight Zhu's initial interview with the local media. Netizens are commenting on this abrupt change. A netizen says sarcastically, because this weather is very rare, the shepherd just happened to dig a rain shelter cave and happened to stock some firewood. See, what a coincidence it is. Another netizen says communist China is a country with lies everywhere. China's flood season is already kicking in this year and fast. The reports are bringing back fears from 2020 when floods left much of the country in a state of crisis. Nearly 80 rivers in southern China have surpassed the flood warning levels. Videos circulating on social media show cars submerged in several feet of water across multiple areas. China's biggest river, the Yangtze River, is also becoming a cause for concern. On Wednesday, water levels in multiple sections of the river had reached at least seven feet higher than records from the same time last year, and it's still on the rise. To prepare for possible flooding, local authorities ordered an emergency response plan and wartime flood control measures. It is a status similar to what's called a state of emergency in the U.S., Last year, massive flooding caused major damages across the country. Floodwaters submerged over 20,000 square miles of farmland. The crisis also caused over $20 billion worth of economic damage. Chinese authorities are now gearing up once again for major flooding in the upcoming months. Coming up, Hollywood actor John Cena is apologizing to his Chinese fans after he referred to Taiwan as a country. But many Americans are outraged 
accusing him of appeasing the Chinese regime for access to the Chinese market. But a Hollywood producer says this is part of a bigger systemic issue. More on that after the break. Trends may be fleeting, but values are timeless. We now bring you this new clothing brand with classic design and luxurious comfort. It's our way of sharing hope and inspiration from the world of Shenyun. We bring you Shenyun Dancer. Wear it with honor. Athlete and actor John Cena is facing backlash for apologizing to his Chinese fans for calling Taiwan a country. Many Americans are outraged, accusing him of appeasing the Chinese Communist Party for access to the China market. But a Hollywood producer says it is part of a bigger systemic issue that no one actor can fix and that there is only one way to solve it. Here are the details. John Cena is best known as a WWE star. He's also an actor and one that speaks Chinese, as many people found out for the first time on Tuesday. After he issued this on-camera apology in Mandarin to his Chinese fans, his mistake, referring to Taiwan as a country. In the eyes of the Chinese Communist Party, it's part of mainland China, and saying otherwise will get you in a whole lot of trouble. Here's his apology. This comes as Cena's latest film, Fast and Furious 9, hits movie theaters in China. But he's receiving a lot of backlash for his apology, as many Americans view it as yet another celebrity kowtowing to the CCP for the sake of monetary gain. The criticism is 100% warranted. Whether he should be the target of it all, um, I do disagree with. Chris Fenton is the former president of DMG Entertainment Motion Picture Group, and for about two decades, he worked on some of the biggest blockbuster movies. He also authored the book Feeding the Dragon, Inside the Trillion Dollar Dilemma Facing Hollywood, the NBA, and American Business. Fenton knows all about what it's like to deal with the Chinese regime in order to access the China market. It was part of his job for many years. As for Cena's apology, Fenton says he believes Cena was just complying with his contract. And he says if Cena came out and stood by his Taiwan statement, he would just be replaced by another actor. So the problem needs to be solved at its root. I really don't think he wanted to step into this controversy, but he did. And we need to use this as a catalyst to fix things. He says no one actor or individual can fix this issue because the problem is systemic and not just limited to Hollywood, but businesses worldwide. Cena may be the catalyst, but Fenton says for real change to happen, the entertainment industry must rally behind Cena. And hopefully us leading by example as the Hollywood community can then spread such a pushback and such a solidarity movement to help other companies that are also accessing the China market to rebalance and disrupt the relationship that they have with China right now that needs to be rectified. He says not only does Hollywood need to unite behind Cena, but the whole of America and the Western world needs to put aside their differences and come together to push back against the Chinese Communist Party. The House has a new bill to counter China. It seeks to make the U.S. more competitive and push Beijing on human rights. NTD's Patrick Hayden breaks down the Eagle Act. The House Foreign Affairs Committee has introduced a new bill to boost economic competitiveness with China and push Beijing on human rights. Representative Gregory Meeks introduced the Ensuring American Global Leadership and Engagement Act, or EGLE Act, Tuesday. Taking a hard line on China is one of the few truly bipartisan issues in a deeply divided U.S. Congress. Biden administration officials have repeatedly listed competition with Beijing among their greatest strategic challenges. The 470-page bill addresses a range of issues, including increased investment to promote U.S. manufacturing, trade, 
work with allies and partners, and re-engagement in international organizations. It would also recognize Beijing's treatment of China's Uyghur Muslim minority as genocide. Meeks is looking to pass the bill in his committee by next month. It would then be combined with legislation being considered by other House committees and eventually combined with the Senate bill. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Republican Senator Josh Hawley has introduced several amendments to an act that challenges Beijing's growing global influence. He says Congress can't miss this chance to begin fixing years of bad U.S.-China policy. His amendments focus on holding the CCP accountable for its role in the virus and ending corporate reliance on slave labor in China. Here are the details. U.S. Senator Josh Hawley introduced seven amendments to the United States Innovation and Competition Act. This piece of legislation that challenges Beijing's growing global influence has largely gone under the radar, but it's one that's uniting lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. Senator Hawley's amendments include imposing a duty of 100 percent on goods made in Xinjiang, a region notorious for slave labor and other human rights violations, requiring a label marking items imported to the U.S. from countries believed to produce goods made by forced or child labor, requiring certain companies to monitor and disclose the use of forced labor in supply chains, and requiring the Director of National Intelligence to declassify information relating to the origin of the CCP virus. Other amendments aim at protecting intellectual property rights and data security. Hawley says Congress has a chance to begin correcting two decades of failed policies that allowed China to thrive at the expense of America. He wrote, that means putting American workers first ending corporate reliance on Chinese slave labor, and weaning Wall Street off their dependence on the Chinese Communist Party. That also means holding the CCP accountable for their role in the outbreak of the pandemic in Wuhan. We can't let this opportunity pass. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said Monday that he's optimistic the act will pass by the end of the week, but it's not yet known if any senators will object to Hawley's amendments. Two Chinese tech giants are welcoming American investment back into their ranks. That's after a Trump-era rule blocked U.S. investors from funding them for months. Global index publisher FTSE Russell announced the news, saying it would add them back to its stock indexes. They are Xiaomi, a smartphone company, and Luokang Technology, a big data processing firm. Both have known links to the Chinese military. The announcement came after the Biden administration opted to remove the two companies from a government blacklist earlier this month. Xiaomi and Luokang were blocked from some FTSE indexes back in March. Their removal came as part of a Trump administration order in January. It blacklisted Xiaomi, Luokang and seven other companies, barring U.S. investors from buying or holding stake in them. The effort sought to prevent U.S. money from funding China's military development. But a U.S. federal judge suspended the investment ban on Xiaomi in March, calling the decision to blacklist the Chinese company deeply flawed. Goldman Sachs has won initial approval to form a joint venture in China with one of China's biggest banks. NTD's Patrick Hayden has more on the rush to capitalize on China's large pool of savings. Goldman Sachs has approval from Chinese regulators for a joint venture with one of China's largest banks, ICBC. Goldman Sachs Asset Management will hold a 51 percent stake and ICBC will hold the rest. Foreign asset managers are looking to get into the Chinese market as it is starting to open up its tightly controlled finance system. This month, BlackRock said it received permission for a wealth management joint venture with China Construction Bank, along with Singapore's state fund Temasek. BlackRock is the world's biggest asset manager. The Financial Times reports that Goldman's research arm says that by 2030, investable assets by Chinese households will exceed $70 trillion. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Communist China's military leaders are shying away from the Pentagon amid tensions with the U.S. The U.S. Defense Department reached out to its Chinese counterpart multiple times, but is still unable to set up talks. A U.S. defense official said the military relationship is strained, no question about that. It is hard to know how much this is reflective of that strain as much as it is just Chinese intransigence. But we certainly want to have a dialogue. We just want to make sure we have a dialogue at the proper level. Last Friday, U.S. defense officials said the dialogue is meant to deal with any accidents and to mitigate potential flare-ups. 
The two countries are clashing over multiple issues, including Taiwan, the South China Sea, and human rights abuses in China. The two sides had their last high-level military talk late last year. There haven't been any such talks since President Biden took office. Senior U.S. and Chinese diplomats last met in March. Reuters reached out to the Chinese embassy in the U.S. for comment, but didn't get a reply. And that's all for today's China in Focus. But before you go, China in Focus is partnering with the Epoch Times newspaper on their new subscription-based streaming platform, Epoch TV. That's where you can watch our exclusive special reports, like this one, every Friday night. In them, we'll explore questions like how China lures in foreign companies to steal their technology, how the Chinese regime is actively collecting health data on people around the world, how the ancient Chinese philosophy of good governance differs from the current-day communist regime, and much more. Be sure to check out these investigative episodes by clicking on the link in the description down below. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you really want to understand what's happening with China. You can still watch our Monday to Thursday episodes for free on YouTube, NTD Cable TV, the NTD website, and the Epoch TV website. In our next special report this Friday, we'll discuss Beijing's ambition over one of the most sensitive types of data, DNA. The Chinese Communist Party is allegedly collecting DNA around the world. That is through a state-linked company offering COVID-19 testing assistance to other countries, granting it access to people's biometric data. They are the ultimate company that shows connectivity to both the communist state as well as the military apparatus. The company has been working with the Chinese military as Beijing looks to weaponize artificial intelligence and gene editing, and not just for domestic control, but also to further its global ambitions. China has two million strong in its military, and it's trying to make them stronger through uh, you know, gene editing. I hope that our actions can surpass the industrial age and allow China to lead the world for the next hundred years of development. How far has China already gotten in building its genetic data trove? And what would its success mean for the world? We explore these questions and more in a new special report on China's DNA ambitions. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.